looking back, I would say, first of all, it wasn't a mistake to resign. Thank God I'm not there now because I Hmm. would not be enjoying it and I probably wouldn't do the job. But I think it was a mistake to let them bully in the way that they bullied. Hey, welcome back to Connection Request. I'm Joel Lehman. Today on the show, I'm talking to Dale Whitaker. He's a senior advisor at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and has spent his career working in academia at institutions including Texas A&M, Purdue University, and the University of Central Florida. He's also a watercolor artist and plays on mean harmonica. I wanted to pick Dale's brain on the state of higher education around the world, both from his perch inside institutions and now outside as a part of the Gates Foundation. We talk about how education relates to careers today, how artificial intelligence will impact the future of learning, and how education remains one of the strongest levers and predictors of economic mobility. We also dig into some of the various alternative learning movements like coding boot camps and Google certifications and unpack the real value of higher education today. Dale also tells the story of his time as president at the University of Central Florida, which ended in a very public battle with Ron DeSantis. Yep that Ron DeSantis and the Florida legislature. I'm grateful to him for being so open about that journey and what he learned from a traumatic period in his career journey. I also, of course, ask him for his thoughts on DeSantis's prospects for the presidency. We'll get to my conversation with Dale in just a minute, but first, a quick word from our sponsor, SK Coffee. This season, we are thrilled to be sponsored by SK Coffee, a specialty coffee roaster based in Minnesota, shipping worldwide. Listeners of the show will remember Sam from season one, where he shared his journey from musician to entrepreneur. We'll hear more from Sam later in the episode. Grew up in the South, rural upbringing. Decided to go to college, decided eventually to get a PhD, and I've been a professor for about three and a half decades. Places like Texas A&M University in Texas, Purdue University in Indiana, University of Central Florida in Florida. And what I do now is I work for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and my title is Senior Advisor, so basically giving strategic advice in uh, our investments in higher education across Hmm. the foundation. But that's like the standard career answer to what do I do. So the other yeah. thing that that I do is I try to row on Lake Superior every morning, live on an island. I'm a uh, watercolor painter and have aspirations to do that full time at some point in the near future. And I believe you play a mean harmonica. So I hope we get into all of that <laughs> and more. I'm so glad to have you on the show today, Dale, to to talk not only about your career, but education writ large. There's a lot of things that people who maybe aren't as close to the space as you have questions about, and whether it's as a career path or people listening who have relatives who are trying to make decisions about education. I'm just excited to unpack the insights that you've learned along the way. Why don't we first, though, go back to young Dale growing up in the South, maybe Whenever you were starting to think about things like higher education and perhaps a career path, what do I need to know about you as a a young man to help understand sort of the path that you ended up taking? Hmm. Worked in a family business. So it was my mother, my father, my brother, and I. I was the youngest. That was a fertilizer and farm chemicals business. We spent all our days outside and long mornings and evenings working as a family. Never really had a good example of a person that had gone to college, although my father had, but in our community. Mm -hmm. So what I saw of college graduates was a a career in sales or something like that. Sure. And always thought I'd be part of the family business. There was a point at which there wasn't room for all of us economically, for my mom and dad and my brother. So my brother joined the business and still with the business and gave me a opportunity or a a need to find something else. Very interested in what I was doing in college at that point. 
and continued down that path, which was engineering and robotics. And it's a lot of fun. At what point did you sort of make the decision while you were in college to then continue on in in a life of academia? How did that come to be? It, It was a very specific moment in time. I was a senior. Uh, My dad was delivering fertilizer in the area and it said, do you want to meet for a cup of coffee? And I said, sure. And he said, Dale, Mike, and I need to know if you're in or if you're out, because if you're in, we're going to need to borrow money and start working on a plan. And uh, it was at that moment, and I had done an undergraduate research project with a Hmm. professor that I thought, there is so much more. And I'm not sure I've even scratched the surface yet. I think I'm out (laughs) and I'm off on my own. So here we go. Was that a tough decision at the time to make of this thing that you had thought you were going to do your entire life all of a sudden sort of flips on a dime? And I'll say too, it's a little bit different, but I had a similar experience, which is my entire life was prepped to be a a band teacher. And for the most of my time in college, that's what I was going to do. And then three semesters to go, I made it what at the time felt like quite a dramatic shift. So I'm curious for you. Yeah. How was that moment? Joel, to be really honest, it was a moment of freedom. Hmm. Um, It was that summer that I did a study abroad in Berlin. I, I didn't really know what was ahead of me, but I knew what it wasn't. And for me, it was exciting and a moment of freedom. I love that. So tell me about the first parts of your career as a professor. As you said, you spent time at Texas A&M. Yeah. How did you like the world of academia at that point in your life? And at that point, were you following things as they arrived and doing the path of what you saw in front of you? Or had did you already have intentions like, I'm going to spend X amount of time doing this. I'm going to go into admin. I don't know. What was your concept of career and your journey with it at that point? It it feels like most of my life, Joel, has been, I haven't looked very far ahead. (laughs) And I've leaned in the directions that were fun and interesting to me. And actually, at the point that I was finishing my PhD, another buddy of mine and I had started a company and it was an artificial intelligence company hmm. around expert systems at that time. We were doing a lot of consulting and building product and so on. And thought maybe that would be the path. And my former department head at Texas A&M reached out and said, if you're interested, we'd be very interested. We've got this hmm. specific role, very interested in you, just at least like for you to take a look at it. This was the time when we were moving into a recession and jobs were starting to shut down and opportunities hmm. were shutting down. I went and had that interview and I respected him a lot and received the offer and made that choice. So that was actually a surprising choice, but it it felt really good. Yeah. And I would say in answer to your question, I just went along and did what professors do Um, in a research one institution. I valued engineering over agriculture. Those are my two areas. Sure. I valued research over teaching. Mm. and learning. And I valued being at an AAU university and a Carnegie Research One University, all the kind of reputational bells and whistles. Yeah. And I valued things like Texas Aggie football. And when I think about so many of those things now and reflecting back, we'll get to it in the interview, I'm sure, but my value system has really shifted significantly. Sure. I think through, through a number of challenges and discoveries. But at that point, I, what I'm saying is I was marching along to the beat of the norms. Something I, I can certainly relate to, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners can, it it feels like often it takes something external or beyond your control to to, to give you prompts or, or nudges in, in a direction that maybe you didn't think you were going to go. So, so tell me in that case, what eventually you made a shift into more administration roles. And I like in your bio, you say you went from professor to provost to president, which is a path I don't know if young Dale growing up in the South would have expected for himself. But talk to me about that shift. What what were the factors in play as you moved throughout the educational system? There, there was a point after being at Texas A&M for almost 15 years that uh, and 
starting to work administratively in research institute leadership and so on, that I thought what I've always enjoyed really is seeing people who have talent and a whole lot of vim and vigor and aspiration Hmm. trying to become something. And I was really bad at caring what other professors thought of me and my work. I was much more interested in what was going on in the classroom. So there was a point, another point, 15 years after that, where another former department head, my PhD department head at Purdue, said, Dale, we've got a job at Purdue. It's in administration, and it's in the College of Agriculture. Hmm. And I made uh, th- those were two huge decisions I felt like for me at the time. Now I look back and say, what was the big deal? But at that time, going from engineering to agriculture felt like a very big reputational shift. Sure. And then going from being a research and graduate education leader to being focused solely on undergraduates and curriculum and student success felt you know like a reputational shift. Of and course. they both felt so right. And I did that for another 13 years and did move at Purdue into like university level type leadership and found that platform, the diversity of uh, disciplines, the ways that different colleges looked at the world. I found it just fascinating and I I loved it. I enjoyed it. So that, that was a gradual but deliberate shift. Yeah, I love that you talk about both what things feel like at the time in terms of reputation and I'll say identity, which is something I think a lot about and we talk a lot about on Mm. the show, but as well as how then in reflection, it's just just starting another chapter. It was just making a shift. And we'll talk more about pirate in general, but if you could, I don't know, pull out learnings from your time of life about, yeah, going through identifying as different things and both paying attention to reputation, but also just like following, it sounds like passion and opportunity. I don't know, any advice to instill upon us and our listeners from the shifts in the journey you've made? Yeah, I I would say this might come from being a watercolor artist. The more you believe you're in control, the more opportunity you're probably missing. Mm. Kind of blinders type thing. I think it makes sense to to think of a career now. I talk to a lot of people that are a lot younger than me now. And for just during my time, the norms were a career was basically an organization you went to and you built your career there and moved up in that organization to some sort of pinnacle. And then you retired. Yeah. I feel much more like a career now is a collection of stories that all hang together by some set of threads yeah. that as you mature and test yourself, you start discovering what those threads are. It's really hard to know that at certain points in your life when you're just sort of building your own identity in a yeah. sense. Yeah. But as I, I often tell folks that are changing careers, don't think of everything as high stakes. Think of it in two-year increments and... What is it you want to be, learn, and do in those during that time? And what doors will that open for you? And then which direction do you want to start leaning? Even if you blow in a little bit, which way do you want to lean? (laughs) I think that's I think that's lovely advice. And at least in in my life resonates with me about it's like a a balance of planning, but also following the winds where they blow. And I I really like the two year Mm -hmm. increment. I think that's um I think that's really smart. So I guess, Dale, that is a perfect segue. I'd love to just pick your brain, and and this will, I think, lead us to your work with the Gates Foundation, but could you give us a little bit of a state of the state on the world of higher education and and universities in general? From where I sit, which is just my own little bubble and world, in the time that I've come up and grown to college, it's never unpopular to say college is too expensive. We've been through all sorts of big shifts and changes in this country in particular. And I think COVID, in a lot of ways, threw a wrench in things. We're living through an interesting AI revolution, which I know you know a few things about and have for a long time. It just feels like there's all sorts of things coalescing. And as you said, the idea of a career and staying at a place and in an industry doesn't really exist for a lot of people anymore. Could you give us kind of your thoughts on how you view the world and the landscape of higher education today? 
It's a really big question. <laughs> <laughs> and let me do it in the way I know best, which is random stream of thought. How about that? Me too. Um, first of all, let me just put on the top of it that there's a lot of distraction. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll come back to that. And so, the, you know, what I'm going to try to do is cut through a little bit of, the, bit of the distraction and at the same time, name it. Sure. First of all, the economy of our future is different than the economy of our past. In, and we've known this for about a decade in very significant ways. And what I mean by that is it's a knowledge economy. Hmm. Uh, and it's moving from a knowledge to a creativity wisdom economy which is different than a transactional labor economy. And so one of the distractions that's out there is if you can weld, you can get a good job. And the, the fact is that's true for every application where welding is not already robotized, robotized yeah. which is 90%. That's like a handful of people. So if you look at our future economy, it is demanding developed talent. And it's demanding the kind of talent that college was built to develop. So that's one piece. So if we just think about, and, and I mean worldwide economy, but there are going to be but there are going to be regions and countries that see that, invest mm -hmm. in that and excel. And there will be other regions and countries that fall back. And we're currently in a fallback position while places like uh, Central Africa, Southeast Asia, um Parts of Europe are in a spring forward position. Yeah. So you're going to see Africa growing India. You've seen yeah. that already in the last 20 years. You're going to see their intellectual investments growing like Finland did 30 years ago. And now you see where Finland is economically. And they used to be a fishing mm. village of mm. a few people. <laughs> Lesson number one is our future economy requires the kind of thought and knowledge capacity that a college education was historically built to deliver. Hmm. Lesson number two is a college education was historically built for the elite. So it was not for the doers, it was for the capitalists and the managers. Hmm. And that started, that has shifted in some big ways, like with the land grant movement after the Civil War, which was a combination of a few things, but it was a recognition of an industrialization movement. So we needed talent to industrialize from agriculture. It was a recognition of the ending of the Civil War and a lot of unemployment. So mm. let's do something, make an investment that might spring us forward. Another one that was, and it brought um, non-elites into higher education for the first time. Mm. Second big time that happened was the GI Bill. Yeah, for different reasons, but under similar settings. So high unemployment, end of a war, and a shift into a science and chemical economy from an industrialization economy. Hmm. So we're kind of at one of those points right now where we're shifting into a knowledge and idea economy. Yeah. And we're moving our dialogue, our narrative, is and our investments are moving in the wrong direction. Well, so let me take that springboard off that elite point. Yeah. Um, middle income white Americans in the land grant from cities, Americans that had served in the war and their children from the GI Bill, which was huge. It really diversified racially higher education. And it also created sort of this um, industrialized mentality of the curriculum. So this mm. is where we started coming up with majors. Rather mm -hmm. than, you know, what do you want to learn and study? And we'll put together a group of faculty to the tutorial model. Sure. So we started industrializing large classes, large curriculum, large campuses, large colleges. But it also moved a lot of people forward. Okay, so what we know is that still a college degree is the best predictor of economic and social mobility yeah. for a person. And more importantly, it uh, becomes a multi-generational wealth creator. Yeah. If your parents didn't go to college and you happen to go to college, your children, at least four out of five of them, are likely to go to college. Yeah. And they will, you will start creating wealth that you pass down and they'll start creating intergenerational wealth. Now, having said all that, 
50% of the people in the country uh, haven't gone to college, can't go to college, can't afford college, or can't afford to leave their jobs and their families yeah. long enough to take four years off and do something. Yeah. Can't afford debt for the rest of their lives, live on wages, haven't accumulated a house or any form of, let's call it wealth that you could sell and get money if you needed it in a pinch. Mm -hmm. And that half of the population lives in a very fragile sense, economic sense. So that's, let me just say a little bit about AI and then maybe we can come back and unpack why I am at the Gates Foundation and that 50% of the population. Yeah. Let me say, you're doing a great job okay. of answering this very big question. So thanks. Phil. Yeah. Continue. On <laughs> There's again. probably so much more. Yeah. Um, no, this is great. So AI, we're at this really interesting pivot again that was predictable, but the pace was unexpected. Hmm. And we are in a hype mode right now. So we're hyped because people are playing with large language models and are impressed yeah. and some art, art models. So these are things that go out and scrape the internet and learn patterns and repeat those patterns. And they seem really smart, but they have no intelligence whatsoever, but they're very good pattern predictors, right? Yeah. So they know what word to put after what other word. Um, are they going to change education? I don't think so. But I do think what we're going to start seeing, and I'll tell you what they don't do, but I think what we're going to start seeing is a lower demand for transactional cognition. Okay. So what I mean by that is where people are doing repetitive thinking tasks, those are going to go away a lot like repetitive physical tasks went away with robotization yeah. of factories and so on. And what it's going to do is elevate the demand for creativity, wisdom, relationship, connectivity. It's going to elevate that demand. But I don't think it's going to... I don't think it's going to change the need for education. I think it's going to change the way we learn. There's a lot to love about SK Coffee, our presenting sponsor for Connection Request. Every time I talk to SK's founder, Sam Chelberg, I'm fascinated to learn more about what makes their coffee so special and why people are so drawn to them. Here's Sam. We're not a company that you're going to get the exact same thing over and over again. It's always going to be an exploration. This is literally an agricultural product, and every year it's different. So. It's like wine in that way. But something even more special than the coffee itself has always stood out to me. It's the entire SK team's passion. They treat their work like a real art form and each of them care deeply about coffee's people, place, and process. Here's Sam again. The way we're trying to tell that story is not through, you know, interesting crafted cocktail coffee drinks, right? It's all, what is the coffee trying to say? What is the producer, the place, the plant itself trying to say the process? And we are literally translating that communication from the raw product into your cup. To learn more about SK Coffee, visit skcoffeeplease.com or check out their excellent Instagram page. If you live in Minnesota, stop into one of their cafes in St. Paul or Minneapolis. You might even spot me there. All those links are in the show notes. Okay, now back to the show. Man, each of these topics we could spend an entire episode on about, couldn't we? And perhaps someday we'll get that opportunity. But I guess one question, both talking about the value of education, which you touched on, as well as AI, makes me think about this movement, I think, largely coming out of Silicon Valley over the past decade or whatever. And sort of Peter Thiel is the person I can put to it the most of, sort of paying students to not go to college and really talking about how, oh, the value of education isn't there. I'm just curious, from your standpoint, is that is that kind of gone now? Are we back to all agreeing, as you said, that yes, this is still like the way to go? Obviously, there's all sorts of things over the past sort of 10, 15 years, whether it's MOOCs and access to information and all that kind of stuff. For a long time, I think we were telling people, oh, just go off and learn coding and you'll never have to worry about education again. 
where has that kind of movement and thoughts coalesced from your standpoint in 2023 as we're talking? I want to answer that in two different ways. In one direction, I want to talk about stackable credentials or about bite-sized learning and okay. where it leads. And on a more cynical path, I want to talk about creating the workforce for those people to make more money. Hmm. Google does a great job of Google certifications so that more people, so that they can grow, they have a talent need, and so that more people can benefit from the services of Google. Yeah. Uh, and let me just say, this last year, two major boot camps, maybe three, have shut their doors, national hmm. scale boot camps. Interesting. Um, and the reason they shut their doors is because the COVID surge for programmers also had a COVID drop. Hmm. And so there was high unemployment among programmers. So this idea that if you get a certification, Microsoft or Google certification, you're definitely going to get a job, wasn't working out. Yeah. So the same people that were making the claim weren't fulfilling the commitment. Yeah. So I think that's like a lot of things, interesting idea may lead to something someday doesn't get realized in the vision that it was originally realized in. And I think that's one of them. Yeah. Let me do say something, though, about this um, idea of stackable credentials or bite-sized learning. Sure. And I work with universities like Western Governors University or Southern New Hampshire University that are really targeted on people who are working, have family commitments, they can't go to a college campus, they need to be met where they are. And a lot of times those folks need to get from a 17 hour, I'm sorry, $17 an hour job to a $25 an hour job to a $30,000 a year job. And for some, for a lot of college graduates, they're way past that by the time they graduate from college after high school. But there are a lot of people that didn't have that family wealth yeah. and have to get there through a series of steps. I get excited by when someone says, if I can get that certification, I can get a $25 an hour job. And if I can use those things that I learned, that cre those credits toward getting that $30,000 a year job, and I can get an associate degree, yeah. and then I can make a little bit of money, save a little bit of money when I'm ready. I can go ahead and get, a, let's say, a four-year engineering degree, and then I can make $80,000 a year, and that's where I want to be. But it may take me 10 to 12 years to get there, yeah. but I know that it's going to be the right thing for my children and my family. So when I think about stackable credentials that where you don't lose what you did, that's what I mean by stackables. In other words, yeah. you took 15 credits, you take that, you get a job. You make some money, you save some cash, you get another 35 credits. That is a pathway for success for that 50% of the people that didn't go to college after high school. I don't think everybody has the same educational needs. And, and let me be clear about that. For people who are coming of age, graduating from high school at the age of 18, have an opportunity to go to a four-year college, sit with peers and professors get exposed to job opportunities for internships and so on. That's a really premium and increasingly unusual experience. Yeah. And that is an experience that people coming of age need. Some people get it through joining the Navy or another type of growing up experience. When I'm talking about these people that may be 25 years old and have a child and have worked for eight years already and know where they want to go and what they need, they don't need that coming of age experience. They don't mm. need the same type of wraparound support. We're finding they need very different supports. They need transportation, child care, sure. you know, time off, be able to do this at their workplace, those kind of supports. But they don't need the what we think of as traditional college. There's a place for both of those, and there's an yeah. important role for both of those. I yeah. just wanted to make that clear. I think that's really helpful perspective and I think makes a lot of sense. And for our listeners, I think it's probably good to separate out those buckets. I think that's a good segue into your work with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Will you tell us a little bit more about what the foundation is all about and your role within it? I think I read you manage something like $30 million in grants. So what is the work and uh, what are you up to with them? Sure. 
first of all, what the foundation is all about is that Bill and Melinda, who founded the foundation about 25 years ago, and Bill's father, um, believe that every person should have an opportunity to add a healthy and productive life. And the every person means every person in the world. No matter how they identify, no matter where they live, no matter what their situation is. In the United States, and I work in the United States program, USP, we call it. Mm-hmm. In the United States, most of our work is education related because, as I said earlier in the interview, it's one of the strongest levers and predictors of economic mobility. Mm-hmm. So, most people to have a really productive and healthy life in the United States need to be not in poverty. Yeah. And so that's where our focus is. I work across several teams, but my primary work is with higher ed, Mm. higher education. I also work with a data team. I work with a team called Pathways that connects K-12 through higher ed to employment. And all of our work has to do with um, making sure that how you identify racially and your income and your zip code don't predict your opportunity for that economic mobility to move forward uh, for you and your family. Yeah. And right now, they all of those do. They're very strong predictors because of the way the system is built, not because of different kind of people live in different kind of zip codes. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I can tell you a little bit more about the portfolio. Yeah, please do, please. Yeah, give us some color commentary as well as what's the day-to-day life like for you, as well as you must come across so many different kind of stakeholders in the world of higher education. Um, Yeah, I don't know. Give us a little bit more color on what your day-to-day is like. Sure. Let me just say what we do. Uh, We've got two major approaches. We call them strategies. One is to help two to 300 institutions get better at helping students graduate and removing that predictor of success. So they're really targeted on Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and low-income student success, because that's where there tends to be a difference. And then the other half of our approach, which is the part that I kind of lean into, really focuses on the people that don't go to college right after high school. Mm. And that's where the greatest opportunity for equity, racial equity is. That's where the greatest inequities are. And so that's the part that I lean into. Mm. Um, My day-to-day, I'm a telecommuter. I'm a remote worker now. I work out of a 16-foot restored Shasta trailer in the woods on an island (laughs) up in Lake Superior. I work with directly with a number of universities. And the kind of investments that we make in them are around helping them develop their own data systems and their capacities to know when they redesign themselves, whether it's helping or hurting the students that we care about. Dale, here's a question for you. And I bet you have a view on this since you've been both inside universities, publicly funded, and also now on this side of things. There are some people in the world that would say, and let's focus on the US for a minute, amazing and wonderful that a foundation, especially one with a great reputation like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, is helping to push things forward and giving a lot of money away to do it, right? But there are some people who say, why isn't our government at all levels doing that? Like, why do we need philanthropy? I wonder if you could just speak a little bit about the interplay between philanthropy and government and any sort of personal views you've come to to figure out in your time. Yeah. I think it's important to understand, Joel, that philanthropy, even as large as Bill Melinda Gates Foundation is, doesn't have the money to do the work, really. It, and what I mean by that is we, we don't have enough to pay teachers to teach in classrooms, let's say. Sure. That has to be borne by the, if it's seen as a public good by the taxpayer, if it's seen as a private good by the person paying tuition. Yeah. In, an, in our country, we have all flavors and blends of how we fund and how we see education as a public or private good. Yeah. What we do is we, when I say we lean in, into something, we try to help uh, measure, help them understand their capacities. Uh, I'm sorry, understand like 
when they do something, whether it's helping or hurting, we support data infrastructure. Yeah. We support innovations of different approaches and solutions, and then very rigorous evaluation of those, and then sharing and scaling those. Hmm. So a lot of what we try to do is look at who's doing something really well, test it on a broader level, and then try to create a public good out of that. Hmm. And so the public good is, you might just think of it as a library of things that work or yeah. have been demonstrated to work. Yeah. Speaking of government, Dale, your last gig, you spent several years at and then eventually were the president of the University of Central Florida. And I know from our chat earlier that the way that you left that was a, was not the way that you planned to leave that job. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that, especially, and I'll tell you the reason I ask. I don't know if you agree, but I think we learn as much, if not more, in unplanned moments and things that maybe don't go the, the way that you had expected to them as we do in the ones that you planned. And you said your career itself has been a version mm -hmm. of that. So will you tell me a little bit about your time at UCF? Sure. And that was one of those things where I think once I, like at Purdue, started at the university level, I could increasingly see myself as a university president. And mainly because I felt personally driven by a certain set of values around students and student success, a student-centered set yeah. of values that I didn't think were well represented. But and so, by God, I thought I could do it better. And the reason I went to University of Central Florida from Purdue was that it wasn't a research one institution at that, well, it was emerging as one. It was a majority minority institution. It was an urban institution. And it was doing great things with students. Hmm. I went there uh, as learning, but but you can probably track, I didn't even think about it at the time, but my entire career was in red states. When I was in Texas, it didn't really impact me that much. I don't think the kind of culture war dialogue was happening then. I left Purdue when Mitch Daniels came in as, who was a former governor, came in as president of Purdue. And we agreed on a lot of things, but we didn't agree on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Hmm. And Big thing yes, to not agree on. It, it was fundamental for me and for him. It was, his approach was to remain silent on it, which I appreciate more than aggressively attacking it. <laughs> hmm. But we just couldn't agree. Yeah. Uh, at the University of Central Florida, we worked hard on making sure that our black students graduated at the same rate as our white students. And we had as many black students or as many women in engineering as we had white men, for example. We didn't get there, but that's what we worked on hard. Yeah. And the political environment, as I, I was provost for four years before becoming president. So provost in universities, a uh, number two person mm -hmm. focused on the academic part. Yeah. as opposed to the business and athletics and so on. Sure. As I was cruising into cruising, as I became president, sure. we were in an election cycle. And this was when Ron DeSantis was running for governor. Rick Heard Scott was running. Rick Scott was running for senator. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were both in very close, highly contested races. And I became president in August, and that same month, within a couple of weeks, a local federal judge threw, overturned a ruling that basically was an overturned an executive order by the governor that there could not be early voting on camp, college campuses. Hmm. So our students came to me and said, we'd like to have a voting center because we have to get on a bus and ride four miles, and it doesn't happen. And not only would we like a early voting center, but we also want to do voter registrations and so on on campus. So it was immediately after the Marjorie Stoneham Denham shootings had happened. Hmm. We had 300 students on our campus that had gone to that high school, hmm. Republicans and Democrats, and they were all anti-gun hmm. <laughs> legislation. Hmm. They were highly motivated. I went on record supporting them and we were the first campus to uh, have an early voting site and all the, up until that point, the other campuses wouldn't comment 
and were getting coached by the, their legislative liaisons, you really don't want to do this. Yeah. I was a little naive. I thought 18-year-olds coming of age with a passion ought to be able to vote. No matter which way they vote, they ought to be able to vote. It's part of the education process. It's part of being part of a civic and civil democracy. Um, I sad to me that's naive, but sure. <laughs> and I, I got crosswise with the governor at that point, and conveniently for him, inconveniently for me, the administration prior to my coming had used carry for, forward money for a building. I had made that decision, and it wasn't supposed to be used for a building. So even though that law changed. I would say Ron DeSantis and Richard Corcoran at the time really wanted to teach universities a lesson and understand, undermine the Florida voters' confidence, start mm. the undermining process in universities. So they targeted our institution. They targeted us with uh, tens of millions of cuts. And I resigned in order to try to smooth that over. Uh, which I, looking back, I would say, first of all, it wasn't a mistake to resign. Thank God I'm not there now because I mm. would not be enjoying it and I probably wouldn't do the job. But I think it was a mistake to let them bully in the way that they bullied. Mm. I don't think our trustees could have stood with me, though, even though you know they were verbally supportive. They were all appointed by the governor. So yeah, uh, it becomes a... It's a conflict of interest. Anyway, I, th I think Florida has really shot themselves in the foot. They have a growing, young, diverse population and, you know, a population now of 25 million. Yeah. And they're going in exactly the wrong direction for a thriving economy. Was something tells me that in the time span of your career, you would have never been able to predict being wrapped up in a public political um moment like that what was that a tough time to live through work through and figure out what you do in that moment yes what'd you learn yeah about and yourself? you know well you know what i learned that um i had always done well and gotten farther by building trust and trusting people and I always told everybody around me, believe that people do what they think is right. Mm. And if what they're doing seems wrong to you, then you know you need to have a discussion about what they think is right and what you think is right. And this was the first situation, Joel, where I encountered, it was a group of five people, all in the House of Representatives. It was the first time I encountered people that were so self-ambitious that they didn't care what was right, literally, didn't care what was right or wrong from a values point of view. They cared about winning or losing or getting more. And I had never, I had always been able to work with people on a basis of trust. Sometimes it was a long negotiation, but that, that shook sort of my foundations of how I related to people for a while, to be honest. And because it was such a blindsiding, and I'll tell you, as president, I was trying to fix the former president's problems yeah. in a very transparent public way. And the more we did transparently, the madder they got. And finally, I was sent a message, understand we're not trying to fix a problem. We need the problem, and then we need blood on the ground so that we can send the signal to the other presidents and to the residents of the state that they better buckle. And I thought, wait a minute. You mean you don't care if I fix it? You don't want to fix the problem? <laughs> really? <laughs> that was hard to recover for me. And frankly, it took me probably two years. That was the most traumatic learning in my life. And now I'm past it. I'm back to trusting people. That's but good. Understanding yeah. that there's a handful out there that you better identify quick and early. And that there really are a few people in the world that are, I'm not going to say, evil, but just uh, it, are totally narcissistic. Let's just say it that way. And uh, unfortunately, getting too much control right now. I'll leave this in a moment, but any thoughts on Mr. DeSantis's bid for the Republican nomination? Yeah, I think it would be hell for the country. And 
He seems to be losing ground, thank God, but I'm trusting, I trust, here we go, our suburban um, Republican women voters to be thoughtful in this election. Makes sense. I want to end on something a bit lighter. Uh, (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) And talk about your work and world in the arts, both the music that you make and uh, your life as, as a watercolor artist. How how long has that been a part of your life? And talk about the interplay between having a, you can tell me if it's a hobby or a career, sort of how you define that, but that part of your life that is so very different from intense public facing roles, whether it's in academia or now on, on your work with the Gates Foundation. What has that kind of meant to you as a part of your kind of overall self and identity? And yeah, just tell me a little bit about your journey with the arts. Way back when I lived in a trailer house in the country in Texas, and we worked on the, the fertilizer company together, I always enjoyed nature, always enjoyed drawing. I put it away as something that, you know, and I played the harmonica starting when I was 13. Cool. I put that away when I was about 25 until I became maybe 50 and then got it back out again because I was becoming bored with myself. And in terms of getting serious about art, first time I started selling art was COVID. And we were in a one room, 600 square foot apartment looking over a street that closed up at five o'clock when the last ferry ran and had an opportunity. I was just drawn to start painting on a daily basis. And I really grew in that time. And part of that was a response to when I was a president, I felt desperate to think for myself. I was Hmm. constantly being fed information, constantly making decisions constantly being scripted for speeches, constantly being moved from one place to the other place and introduced to people and meet people. And it was like, wait a minute. And I was, I enjoyed so much the pause and the observation. And for me, painting has been much more about seeing and experiencing than about what comes out on the paper. And that's the part that I really love. And that's why I say I'd like to dedicate my life to that as Mm. I make a transition from the Gates Foundation over the next four to five years to that being my next full-time gig. Tell me a little bit. It puts my head in a very different place. Yeah. On on a different scale, I, I can relate. Like for me, music is, it's many things, but it's in some ways a practice in mindfulness. Like my job in my life is surrounded by screens and information and a lot of it. And like one of the times that I can just totally focus on one thing singularly and not have a thousand thoughts running through my mind is like when I'm playing music or right, like you just solely focus on the task at hand. And I imagine it's somewhat similar for you. What does dedicating a life to the arts look like? Do you, what do you think that'll take shape over the next few years? Paint every day. Like it. Uh, Yeah. I plan to run a gallery. And what I'd like to do with it, not just for myself, but what I'd like to do with that is put a real focus on the artists and especially Mm. emerging artists and maybe indigenous artists because we're in Mm. tribal lands surrounded by. um, And there's so much artistic expression that young people are creating. Mm. I find that galleries that I've experienced have tend to be fairly transactional. It's just another way. It it is another way for an artist to make a living. Yeah. I won't have to do that, which because I'll be like living on retirement type money. Yeah. I don't have any interest in having a recreational retirement, (laughs) whatever that is, golfing and traveling around in an RV. Uh, But I am very interested in going back to this thing that drew me to my first university job. And that is when you see people that know what, that are aspiring, that are trying to create their lives, that are building something and they're sacrificing, they're moving to the future. I want to get back to that, but with artists, with people Mm. that see that as their portal. 
that's exciting. And I look forward to watching that journey um, unfold from afar and perhaps uh, making a visit up one at, at the grand opening. And I'll say that you've got beautiful work. You can see some of it on um, your website, realdalewhitaker.com. Dale, before I let you go today, any anything I forgot to ask you about or other wisdom you want to impart to me and, and our listeners today? No, I don't think so. I just think that a sleeping dog in a chair behind you set the the mood for the whole interview. It was very <laughs> relaxing. Dale Whitaker, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the, the conversation and your commitment to education and the arts. And I just, I learned a ton and really had fun getting to chat with you. Thanks for your time today. Enjoy it, Joel. That is it for today's episode of Connection Request. If you enjoyed today's episode, would you make sure you're following us? It'd mean a lot. Today's show is produced by Marie Ayanazo and me, Joel Lehman. Our theme music is by the amazing Mike Lauer and his band Viewers Like You. It's from their album Panoramia. The show is a production of Shrug Content, a podcast studio based in Minnesota. You can learn more about us at shrugcontent.com. Special thanks to SK Coffee, our presenting sponsor. You can learn more about them at skcoffeeplease.com. If you live around the Twin Cities, ping me. I'll take you there myself. First cup is on me. You can connect with the show on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. Send us feedback, guest ideas, and funny TikToks at connect at shrugcontent.com. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.